for DPM, uh, ready to inject the uh, air core. How is the uh, spacing and pinching look on the drop injectors? You're good to go, Fred. Okay, copy that. That's affirmative. And Fred, you might try to control that rotation. Copy that. A great day for NASA and the shuttle crew. We are fortunate to bring you a very special interview tonight, this morning. We take you now to the Space Shuttle Columbia, where astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria joins us. And good morning to you, and welcome to NBC Nightside. Can you hear me? Morning, Tanya. How are you? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Uh, this is day six up in space. How are you and the other crew members doing physically? We're doing great physically, and we're having a ball. All right, having a ball. I like to hear that. Now, I want to make sure I get your title right. You are a mission specialist and flight engineer in charge of orbiter operations. Obviously, sounds like a pretty important job keeping folks uh, rolling around the Earth there. What are your responsibilities on board the Space Shuttle Columbia? Well, let me explain a little bit about the uh, way we're divided up on the crew. We have seven people, uh, also a lucky number, and uh, we're divided into two shifts, a red shift and a blue shift. On each of those shifts, we have uh, an, orbiter an orbiter crew and a payload crew, and on my shift, which is a blue shift, I'm the orbiter crewman, and then we have two payload crewmen. I'm uh, floating back here in the space lab module, which is where the payload crewmen conduct uh, most of the science on the flight. Uh, while they're doing that, somebody has to sort of mine the store up front, and that's my job, and the other two orbiter crewmen on the red shift, uh, Commander Ken Bowersox and Pilot Ken Rominger. So basically, while they're back here doing uh, all the hard work, we're up there sort of navigating, uh, taking care of the orbiter systems, and doing a whole lot of looking out the windows. Uh, when do you sleep? Uh, in another part of the orbiter, uh, just under the cockpit, we have what we call the mid-deck, and there are uh, four sleep bunks in there, so only four, a maximum of four people have to sleep at a time, and that's where we sleep. They sort of look like, uh, actually a little bit like coffins. They have a sliding door, which keeps out the noise and the, and the uh, light pretty well, so it's not too bad. I have to ask you, too, what do you see when you're looking out the windows? Well, it's the most incredible view uh, I can imagine. I've... Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these IMAX movies on the really big screens, and those do a pretty good job, but when you get up here, it's at least 10,000 times better. It's really breathtaking. It's fantastic. Tell us a little bit about the experiments that we know will be useful in space station missions and also for medicinal purposes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those, the oil and water experiments and food experiments? I can tell you a little bit about that. Uh, let me just give a couple of examples. We have one experiment called zeolite crystal growth, which uh, is a, an experiment to be able to try to grow better zeolite crystals. Zeolites are used a lot on Earth for uh, such things as chemical sieves and uh, especially used in the petroleum industry to do uh, refining of petroleum. So if we can develop a better, more perfect crystal and understand how those properties uh, work, we can actually gain a lot of benefits in that regard. Uh, secondly, another kind of crystal that we're growing in space is a protein crystal. Uh, when the pharmaceutical companies manufacture drugs to combat infections or ailments, 
Uh, they need to know as well as they can the, pro the structure of these protein crystals so they can design the, um, the drugs to fit into these sort of nooks and crannies. And in space, in the absence of gravity, we can grow these crystals in a much more perfect sense than we can on Earth. So hopefully we'll be able to use these to uh, put, put them to good use with the medical community. I understand that you're divided into teams, a red team and a blue team. Explain to us what exactly the significance of that is. Well, there's no significance to the colors, of course. It's just a way of uh, calling ourselves one thing or the other. Um, but we just divide into two teams to be able to work around the clock, basically. So while the blue team is awake, the red team is asleep, and vice versa, we do have about a four-hour period at the end of uh, and beginning of each day where we're both awake. But the, the majority of the work that we do in a laboratory goes on during those eight-hour periods. Can you explain, for those of us who have never experienced it, what weightlessness feels like? Boy, that's a tough question. Uh, I, I could actually show you. Hang on. Oh, gosh. A lot of... I'll tell you, the, the, <laughs> close, the closest experience I can uh, equate it to is it's sort of like some um, scuba diving, only the air is very unviscous, very fluid, and you can, uh, it's effortless to move around. You just put the slightest force on something, and you find yourself floating across the, uh, the laboratory very gracefully. It, it, it's really, it's a, it's a great experience, and it's hard to describe the feeling, but it's wonderful. Well, I know you're a rookie. Is this everything you had hoped it would be? I tell you, Tanya, I thought that uh, it would be a hard thing to be able to reach my expectations because they were pretty high, but this has far exceeded what I expected. It's been a blast, and I'm looking forward to the next few days and, and looking forward to doing this many times again. Okay, on a personal note, I have a little background information here on you. I understand you're 37 years old. You're the first Spanish-born astronaut in orbit. You graduated from Mission Viejo High School in California. So two questions in regards to this. When you were back in high school in California, did you dream that you would someday be doing this? And for all the youngsters out there who aspire to become astronauts, how did you do it? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I have a lot of people that I work with, a lot of fellow astronauts, who actually did dream on, about doing this since they were you know, small children, uh, even before high school. Uh, I had a little different circumstance. I wanted to be an architect when I was in high school, and sometime between then and the age of 25, which is when I really set my sights on this, is when I got converted. Uh, the way I would do it to all those uh, who aspire to be like my friends who already knew what they wanted to do when they were very young kids, I would say only do it if it's something that you really want to do, something you're very good at. Uh, it has to be something that you like. So make sure that it's something that you like, and then... Uh, just work your hardest in school. Do the best you can, and uh, but always try to keep uh, a perspective on, on the fun part of life and uh, something enjoyable as well. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap up this interview, and we thank you so much. Michael Lopez Alegria, astronaut aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia, joining us from space here on NBC Nightside. This is Mission Control Houston. We're now looking at live television. The module and the payload bay cameras. Looking at television uh, from a television camera that's mounted in the front forward portion of Columbia's cargo bay, looking back towards the laboratory module. Below Columbia, the uh, coast of the Mediterranean Sea as uh, the spacecraft is 170 miles above northern Africa. Go ahead, story. Next time you're at panel R2, I've got a switch throw for you. All right, stand by. Hey, what story? I can't know I can get it. Okay. On R2. Thanks, 
R2 circ pump to GPC on uh, circ pump number two. Thanks, Rommel. We saw you can see the north coast of Africa there in your picture. Uh, up to our north, we can see Italy, Sardinia, Sardinia and Sicily. Really a great sight today. Yeah, we're starting to pick it up in the camera, too. Yeah, it's a little hazy and oblique. I'm not sure the cameras are going to give it justice. That uh, 39 degrees is really great, isn't it, Sox? 39 degrees is a great inclination. One of the things that's been really nice is we've been going to bed at the same time the last few nights. Helps you get on a regular schedule. Sox, can you expound on how good 39 degrees really is? This view again, uh, showing the Nile and the, the Red Sea as Columbia continues south. Current altitude 170 miles. Columbia. We've been on orbit since last Friday conducting science experiments as part of the United States Microgravity Laboratory. But tonight our thoughts are with the national pastime. To the Braves and to the Indians, good luck in Game 5 of the World Series. Now let's play ball.
with the water from dehumidifiers inside the laboratory cabin. The dumps now beginning a report to Again, uh, water will be dumped uh, from the lab, uh, expected to take about 15 minutes or so. The uh, port or left-hand payload bay door of Columbia was fully opened uh, for this dump uh, to allow uh, better clearance and ensure that uh, no ice or uh, water collected on the edge of the door uh, in its partially closed position that it occupies for the majority of the flight. That uh, door opening procedure went very well. Uh, once the dump's completed, uh, the door will be uh, closed again to its uh, partially uh, closed position, the position it uh, occupies to help protect against uh, space debris impacts on uh, the interior radiators in a Freon cooling loops along uh, the inside of that uh, left-hand door. Columbia's orientation during much of this flight, a gravity gradient orientation, one that has a natural stability to it and that uh, minimizes jet firings. And so while we bring video to the ground from the geophysical fluid flow cell experiment, science video for that uh, team of researchers that are looking at uh, very complex fluid flows, modeling very complex fluid flows, as we can see. Uh, at the same time, we have an opportunity to take a look inside the Space Lab module with uh, TV coming uh, from both sources by means of the HIPAC digital TV system. Trying to locate Q card, Q card number three, you said? That's affirmative, Al. Let me try to get a reading on where it might be. The only one we have is CC-1. GFFC, and uh, it has been, uh, over the course of the mission now, it has been running a rather large variety of uh, scenarios or uh, sets of conditions to uh, model particular phenomena involving fluids, and, uh, and this video coming down now from Columbia is providing uh, some of the uh, indications of uh, what's going on in the scenario that uh, is currently underway. The uh, GFFC uh, falls in the area of fluids uh, physics research, but it's also one which uh, provides insights into specialized problems of having to do with uh, our environment and uh, having to do with uh, conditions on other bodies in heavenly bodies in the universe such as the sun and uh, other stars and as well as planets such as uh, Jupiter now uh, at the moment we're taking a look at uh, one of the other uh, areas of uh, science activity and uh, we're getting some video uh, with the uh, shuttle's uh, camcorder uh, video 
shuttle's camcorder being the source of this video to take a look at uh, one of the uh, areas of protein crystal growth research. Kathy, we've got our video back and wonder if you can uh, video select over to IR so we can take a look there. Yeah. 